that trade one pair theory is really <laughs> interesting. Uh, if you were looking for that other session, it would, they would have moved to room C.1. <laughs> <So, yeah. laughs> okay, um, so this is what we are going to do, the part uh, that probably consists of two parts. In the first part, we will want to understand the basics of all term mechanics, like the special phenomena which arise here. My goal is to give you some kind of intuition for this rather unintuitive topic. <laughs> And then after we have mastered the basics of orbital mechanics, we are going to take, talk about this one weird trick from K theory. And I'm very sorry, and I'm actually not sorry at all for the feedback. <laughs> and remember, this is a mathematics talk, so you have some responsibility, but it will be a good talk. Please always feel free. You are very much encouraged to ask questions. You earn bonus points if you interrupt me as hard as possible in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> also, I have a remark. Thanks now. <laughs> <laughs> Start. 
if you drop, uh, push it like harder, yeah, then maybe it will go 10 meters or even 20 meters before reaching the ground. Okay, and if you uh, throw it like really, really hard with a velocity of 11 kilometers per second, which is 40,000 kilometers per hour, which is like 40 times as fast as an usual airplane is going, assuming that the atmosphere wouldn't, uh, wouldn't break, uh, uh, would stop the, the throw, then you would have this trajectory. The ball would go on and go on. It would always be falling, but also it will go in this direction, and it will always miss Earth. So by throwing a ball like really, really, really hard in the horizontal direction, you can make it go on a circular orbit around Earth. That's how you reach space and stay. You have to have a really high horizontal velocity. If you push it, push the ball even harder, then you will increase the maximum height above the Earth. So your orbit will turn into an elliptic shape. If you throw it even harder still, the eccentricity of the orbit will increase even more, yeah, so that you have here more distance. And at some point, you can you throw it hard enough, and then you will have a velocity so that it never returns to Earth. This is part E. And I'm sorry, I just mis mixed up the velocities. If you want uh, this path, then you only need 8 kilometers per second. If you want this path, you need 11 kilometers per second. Yes? Did we mention that the uh, reality will be only grabbed in the yeah. universe? Also, they translate when you become part, right? Uh, no, and that's a very good first question. Thank you very much. Even if you merge it, imagine you, the universe to be only consisting of Earth and no body whatsoever. Then, if you manage to uh, achieve these 11 kilometers per second, and assuming there's no friction from the atmosphere, else you have to throw it harder, this is an, a trajectory which will never return to Earth. It will go on and on and on and on, and it will never return to Earth. This is called a hyperbolic orbit. Actually, they are not round, like circles or elliptic. Yeah, uh, well, there is a special case where it's circular. Like, the first time you've managed to throw it so hard that it does not come back to Earth, then it will be perfectly circular. And if you throw it a little bit harder, then it will be elliptical. And if you throw it harder even still, then it will be hyperbolical, so that means it will leave Earth and never turn back. Yeah. Because you have not yet reached the necessary velocity for escaping Earth. There was a question in the back, I think, or somewhere. Can yeah. you please repeat the questions from the first row so that yeah. we can? Yeah, I will try to remember. Thank you. And if you don't, please just interrupt me. Yeah. Thanks. And I have a short, a short table for you, namely the escape velocities you need for fully escaping the, or the, the body in question, which is like going on the path E, leaving it forever, for all times. So for Earth, it's 11 kilometers per second. For Moon, it's much less. It's only 2 kilometers per second. This is because Moon has much less mass and therefore less gravity. If you were an inhabitant of the Sun, and you wanted to leave the Sun, for instance, because it's so hot there, <laughs> then you would need 620 kilometers per second. And if you decided that Milky Way is not a nice galaxy at all, you need to have 550 kilometers per second. Um, is, is this uh, dependent on how far I'm away from the center of gravity? Yeah, this is very much dependent on how far away you are from the center of gravity. So, so it's, uh, this also explains why this is, in comparison to the sun, not a ridiculously large number. You would think that to escape Milky Way, you would need like billions of kilometers per second. But that's not true. In fact, a smaller velocity suffices as for escaping the sun. This is because we are very far away from the center 
of the galaxy. And there, the gravitational pull of the center is, is less effective for us. So where do we start when it's escaping from the Milky Way? Uh, like here, in, in our region. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, all the first three numbers are from the surface of the body, right. and the first yeah. number is from where we are in the galaxy, not from the center of the galaxy. Right, right, of course, yeah. happen to know what gravitational pull the Earth has at the at the height of the moon? Uh, no, I don't know it offhand, but maybe one of the experts knows, and I repeat the question very much, what's the gravitational pull of the Earth, not at the height of the surface or at the height of the infinite space, too, but at the height of the moon? Does it know? Anybody? It's the distance from the moon, 1.5. It's what, like one light second? So 300,000 kilometers, and ah, you are right, Catherine. Wait. You don't have the It's the speed of the moon across the moon's face. Yeah? I think what we escaped the sun. Yeah. So we are the first of the Yeah. Right. This is a very good point. I repeat it. So often, uh, you hear uh, proposals like all this nuclear waste, we should just dump it into the sun. <laughs> so at first sight, this is a good idea because in the sun, it cannot do any harm. The sun is like a nuclear ball. It's on itself. Yeah, it's no problem. But reaching the sun is actually quite difficult. For well, this, you need like it's a metric. You need like this ridiculous amount of kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it depends, okay, it depends on your definition what you want to do. Do you want to turn into on orbit around the sun or to land on the sun? The decaying orbit. Decaying orbit would probably be enough, right? Well, but you need to reduce the speed because the Earth is uh, rotating around the sun. Yeah, in yeah. Very yeah. Space. yeah. And, and I saw that in a second. That energy yeah. Then it is in the reverse direction, so yeah. the, 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 the work is harder actually to reach the yeah. sun and to reach Mars. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but that's the speed of the surface of the sun, and all we would need to do is just uh, compensate the speed of the Earth, which is much lower. And it's still a lot of Yeah, it's a lot of Yeah, it's not less than a lot. We have come to exactly this point for that Venus. Um, um, would you design the sufficiently Reliable uh, boosters. Yeah. <laughs> because we have plenty of nuclear waste around, and the launch port sequence normally ends in the rapid unscheduled right. surface assembly. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not a good idea. Um, okay, one more question, and then we'll continue yeah. for now. If you escape the sun at six, 600 kilometers per second, yeah. can you escape the Milky Way at the same time? Because yeah, if you do it like cleverly in a clever path, you can do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. can, if you try to escape the sun using this 600 kilometers per second, can you also manage to, in the same maneuver, escape the galaxy? The answer is yes, you can do you, you lose velo velocity if you uh, uh, leave a uh, uh, planet, or not? Yeah, yeah, the planet tries to hold you back. Yeah. But uh, you may still have like velocity <coughs> remaining. I think I want to continue with the next mm -hmm. point, yeah? But maybe you will just... Okay, I think I'll just do it, okay? <laughs> the second point is velocity is very important. So in ordinary life, it only matters where you are. So like when your friend is calling you, he's asking you, hey, where are you? Yeah, because he wants to reach you. In space, it would be more, much more appropriate to say, hey, where are you? And how fast are you traveling at the, at the current moment? Because there's a huge difference, you've already seen it before, between being like 100 kilometers above the ground and having no horizontal velocity because then you will just drop down again 
or being there have an, an, a large horizontal velocity so that you encircle Earth. In ordinary life, you can always easily change your velocity. For instance, if you want to come to a full stop, then just wait a little bit for friction to pull you down. If you want to accelerate a little bit, then go faster on your bike. Yeah? But in space, changing velocity is always a, a, a difficult matter. And stopping is just as hard as speeding up. So when the Americans landed on the moon, they used like $1 billion to get off from Earth. And they used like $1 billion to stop when, when having reached the moon. Yeah. And as, uh, remember for a, a couple of months ago, there was this mission to Pluto, and it took pictures, but only for a very short time. And people asked, why did this mission not stay at Pluto and encircle it for a longer, a longer amount of time? It was not possible because you would have to break there, and it's like very, very hard to do. Yeah? So if you need 618 yeah. kilometers yeah. to escape the sun, yeah. how did I don't know it often. Uh, probably because they use clever tricks, uh, not unlike those we are we're going to see in part two. It's a, it's a very good question, of course. It's a very good question. Yeah. Always double check what I'm saying. <laughs> really, I'm not an, an, an all expert on this topic. I'm just a huge fan of the second part. <laughs> By this we mean the problem where you assume that there's only one body who is exerting gravitational pull, like only the Earth in the universe or only the Sun in the universe. There are exactly three kinds of shapes you can be traveling at if you do not start your thrusters and change the way you are traveling. Either you are on an elliptic orbit, perpetually revolving around the central body, or you are on a hyperbolic orbit, where you escape the body, or you are at a parabolic orbit, there's exactly one kind of it, it too looks approximately the same as a hyperbolic <coughs> orbit, there you too escape the central body forever. The only difference between the parabolic case and the hyperbolic case is that the, the, at the parabolic case, you are getting slower and slower and slower. You still manage to escape the central body, but as uh, the farther you go away from it, the slower you are. With a hyper and eventually, like in infinite time, you will reach zero kilometers per hour. But with a hyperbolic orbit, you still have some velocity left over. Okay. There was a question. I think I have this answer, and I think it's what you just said. There were okay. assertions at major objects, Saturn and Jupiter and other mm -hmm. objects. That gets you, that's how. Like gravitational assists. Yeah. yeah. Through insertions at large objects. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know often the, the project for you. But I, I should probably. Like, yeah, you know those nerds who are learning digits of pi to show off? <laughs> <laughs> they, they should rather learn the space path of a uh, very important space. <laughs> I didn't mean it in a derogatory way, by the way. I'm one of those nerds who learn the digits of pi. What was the question? How much? Uh, 500. <laughs> <laughs> A final remark on this slide, then we'll continue. Uh, always remember to keep your model straight. Oftentimes, we will be neglecting the atmosphere. And a very important point is to really not be is to check whether you need the Earth to be rotating around itself for your arguments to make sense or not. For instance, a space elevator, a space elevator will not work at all if the Earth didn't rotate around itself then you would just go 100 kilometers to the top. Yeah? And if you were to drop an apple there, it would just fall back again, because as we've discussed, the gravitation is almost exactly the same as on the ground. <coughs> OK, now it's time for some light to be for changing orbits. So let's hope this works. OK. So in the middle you see Earth, it's blue, and here you see ISS, International Space Station, and here you see a rocket which is trying to carry like persons or cargo to the ISS. <laughs> and you see 
uh, by this in the initial conditions, it's always on the it's already on the right orbit, but it's just like um, the, the angle is not correct. Yeah, it has to speed up a little bit. So let's try this for this body to catch up with this one. Uh, I have uh, can click here, and then I can apply acceleration in any direction I want to. And at the top uh, upper right, I will see the amount of change in velocity. I, I do that. You will now try to tell me what to do, and it's a rhetorical question. Yeah. So I'll answer it myself. <laughs> Imagine you are on, on the highway, yeah? And you're traveling with 100 kilometers per hour, and this guy in front of you is traveling, and you want to catch up on him. Yeah? Then what you do, you simply accelerate a little bit, then you will go faster, and eventually you will you meet up. Yeah? This is a very basic strategy, it works in real life, that's the right here. So let's move a little bit into the direction of the ISS. Damn it. <laughs> Did it, this isn't, it didn't work at all. Accelerated towards Earth, 
the very good question. I, uh, I spent uh, many hours yesterday to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what happens if you accelerate towards Earth? Let's just try that. So here, for instance, and we want to accelerate towards Earth. Yeah. So in this direction, yeah? yeah. Okay. <laughs> If you want to think about this, I encourage you to do two things. First of all, after the talk, come to the front and ask questions to this smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> Towards your body, then it actually makes, makes a slight difference whether you do it over a whole amount of time, like 10 minutes, or whether, whether you do it in, uh, instantaneously. And you will see slightly different effects. Yeah? So you should probably play cover space. Of course, yeah, you should yeah, yeah. play cover space program. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's what <laughs> oh, you think they know? <laughs> yeah? If you're on the ISS yeah. and you're like working outside and have this jetpack, yeah. If you want to re go back to the ISS, so you actually have to fly away from it or like decelerate? No, uh, yeah. as long as you're like in the near vicinity of the ISS, this wired weirdness of orbital mechanics does not come into play, and you can just be as normal. I mean, you don't have friction, so you have to be a little bit careful to not like overshoot and so on. But other than that, you don't have to keep track of anything. But as long uh, as soon as you're like two kilometers away, you have to pay careful attention to orbital. How much? Two yeah. kilometers? Approximately two kilometers. Okay. Yeah. Especially if you have basically no delta V. Right, yeah. Uh, I think I should <coughs> talk about the word delta V just for a second before we come to the second part of the talk. Um, so in ordinary life, you remember the usage of how much fuel you need, like in liters, yeah? You need so many liters of gasoline to reach your target. The unit in, sp in space travel is instead delta v, the change in velocity required. For instance, to leave Earth, you need a delta v of 11 kilometers per second. You need to have a rocket which is so good to, in, in order to exert 11 kilometers per second. And for, for those maneuvers, you see here at the top, this maneuver needed 0 0.3 kilometers per second. Yeah, and if you just, for instance, you need to do five maneuvers, then you can just uh, think about what delta V you, you need at each of those points where you're doing the maneuvers. Then you can add those individual numbers, and this is your delta V budget. This is how much fuel, uh, this you can translate into fuel, and this is how much fuel you have in order to do that. The international measure yeah, for hardness for reaching things in space is delta V. Okay. Yeah. Franco, what's the basic commerce per, per uh, hour that everyone kind of understands that you can give to give what a kilometer per second is? In other words, I'm asking him, or you, yeah. to give us what I would call the natural speeds we're used to. Is it 100 kilometers an hour? Is it 0 0.001 second? You want one kilometer per second translated into kilometers per hour? Yeah. Just yeah. a rough translation for it. Quoted. Yeah. It's what? Factor of 3.6. Factor of 3.6 in what direction? <coughs> one meter per second equal, uh, one meter per second equals 3.6 kilometers an hour. Okay, so this is 3,600 kilometers per hour if you are in the kilometers per second range. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's talk about a topic which is not very pleasant. And the tyranny of the rocket question. Rocket scientists hate this. <coughs> Sorry? I, I'm just cursing that guy. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you uh, change velocities in space? So, the cool new thing is to do like ion drives and so on, but the conventional way to, to doing this is to exhausting gas in the direction where you do not want to go. Yeah. So, you're like putting gas into this direction. And then by the law of conservation of inputs, you will be traveling that way. Okay? <laughs> this is how you change your velocity, how you accelerate the brake in space. 
but fluid itself has a mass. Yeah, fluid it takes space and it has a mass. So if you have some payload, like for instance some astronauts or some uh, scientific instruments which you want to get to, to space, to orbit, to moon, whatever, you need some fuel for this for the payload. But then the fuel itself is mass. Therefore, the total weight of your rocket just increased. You need some further fuel in order to be able to lift up the fuel you just had put in. Now, your rocket just got a little bit heavier again. You need even more fuel to lift this, and so on and so on. So the good message is that this is not a vicious circle. This is not an infinite circle. It's not the case that you would need infinite fuel to reach moon. But it's an exponential circle. You need uh, the, the total amount, uh, the total uh, mass of your rocket will be the mass of your payload, which you what, what, what you're actually interested in in reaching space, times the exponential <coughs> function in delta v. And you know the exponential function is like increasing very fast. And this is why rocket scientists are so like fixated about this delta v. If by some circumstances you could manage to reduce the delta V needed by just a tiny amount, like a couple of persons, those rocket scientists would be extremely happy because a small reduction in delta V yields, to a, 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 yields a large reduction in the total amount of fuel you will need. Conversely, if you need a little bit more delta V, then you have to add in lots of more fuel. Yeah? And these new ways uh, of, of reaching space and, and doing things we will talk about in a second, they have little data of savings, like 20%, 20%, 30%, but it's, a, it's completely changing the board yeah, because of this exponential dependence. Yeah? And the rocket is made out of fuel and fuel and fuel and a little bit metal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just fuel. <laughs> it's a <laughs> little bad thing. This is, because, uh, this is also why, why people are like, very excited about alternative methods where you do not have to carry your fuel with you. For instance, you have a nuclear reactor on, on board on your spacecraft, which just generates energy. Yeah? Yeah. Is it called the natural logarithm? Uh, yeah, I, 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 so normally this, uh, this equation is solved for delta v, and then you will have the natural logarithm appearing there. But I wanted to give the formula for the total mass, and that is the instrument. Later on, I will give you a present, namely a little card for keeping in your pocket uh, about the exponential function. Then you have like 500 digits of that, uh, each of the one. And there was a question? Or I would say uh, achievable ratio of uh, fuel to twilight weight of the spacecraft. I don't know. Okay. Let's come to the second part of the talk. Okay, one clear trick from Cave Theory. So what's Cave Theory? Cave Theory, you've probably seen uh, Jurassic Park, where it was very neatly explained. Chaos is when things depend very, very sensitively on the initial conditions. Yeah? For instance, I have this book. And if I drop it, it drops. And if I have to drop it a little bit with a slight edge, it will drop just to about the same place. This is not a chaotic system. Okay? But if I have a pen, and I would balance the pen on my finger, it would be a chaotic system. So at first, it would like to stay upright if there were no gas molecules hitting it. But then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends very, very sensitively on all the matter in the universe. This, this pen is like really, really intelligent. It detects all the matter in the universe and all the gas molecules sitting here, and then it decides to go for any of the possible directions. This is a chaotic system. The standard example, thank you very much, is uh, like the wings of a butterfly can cause gigantic storms. Yeah? For, the kind effects add up and add up and up and up, up and suddenly you have a giant storm. This is what can happen in a couple of chaos. So this seems like to have uh, to be dangerous to exploit, but actually it's what these people are doing. Yeah? Um, are quantum effects 
uh, respected in accounting system, or are they just left aside because they are unpredictable? For, for these kind of clients, we do not need any quantum mechanics, but we do need the general theory, uh, uh, theory of relativity yeah, to, to have the orbits exactly right. In general, or? or? Uh, ge I think at some points you actually need the general theory, just like. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem about conventional space travel? The problem is you need so much fuel to do things. That's the first problem. You need one billion dollars to get off from the Earth, one billion dollars to stop at moon at the moon. This has more serious. Uh, so even if, if money was well, was no importance, this would still be a problem because at these space missions you need to ensure that your rockets are able to fire again after they've been in space for maybe a quite a long, long amount of time. Yeah? You're sitting like on this gigantic ball which can explode at any second. Yeah? You have to make sure that it does not explode at all in the several months you are taking to, for instance, travel to the Mars. And then you have to ensure that they go up again in exactly in a controlled manner to do exactly those maneuvers you want to do. With these new tricks, <coughs> You can do the following. You start at low Earth orbit. You do one very special kind of maneuver for which you need fuel. And then you switch off your engines and you will never need them again. The spacecraft will travel by itself on a very complicated, sh uh, complicated shaped orbit tra trajectory <coughs> to your destination. It might make, it make take several rounds to do this. And then at the destination, it will Almost by itself, it will only need a very, very tiny, tiny touch. It will not need huge rocket engines. It will just need a light, tiny touch to land on your, on your, on the, or to get into an orbit around the body you will be studying. You do not need to break with this approach. Yeah? You start Earth with lots of fuel, and then the rest of the trajectory is happening on itself, and the breaking at the target is also <coughs> happening by itself, and I want to explain to you how this is possible. That very short. This kind of slight request, <coughs> a lot of people are talking behind us. Yeah. They're not really uh, expecting the fact that you're talking to something that's really interesting. Ah. They think that they're talking more okay. than yeah. yours. So I would ask everyone to please focus on this. Yeah, OK. Fair enough? Yeah. yeah. OK. The first thing to notice is uh, beforehand we always thought about a central body in the center. And there are situations where unintuitive, unintuitive, but easy after you have mastered them. There were three types of trajectories, elliptic orbits, parabolic orbits, and hyperbolic orbits. The situation is completely different with a uh, true uh, a larger system consisting of many bodies which each have a mass which you cannot neglect. Like for instance, Earth and Moon, or Earth, Moon, and Sun. I'll show you an example. Uh, okay. <coughs> yeah. So now we have the Earth in the center, the Moon at the top, and some rocket. And I just want you to watch that this is not the kind of orbit you will, you've known like from the first part of the talk. Because your thesis. <laughs> so at the end, this was a numerical error, yeah? because uh, I mean, there are very fancy algorithms for doing this right, and there are also very naive ones, and I think the third most naive one in the yeah. imaginable. Uh, but you have seen this, yeah? like these spontaneous size changes here, these do not happen in a or normal, normal one for body problem. Uh, um, so there, in fact, there is no characterization of how the path could look like in a multi-body system. They are not restricted to ellipses and hyperbolic orbits and so on. They can look very weird, very chaotic. They can make like any motion imaginable. Yeah. That's the first thing to keep in mind. The trajectories are much, much, much more complicated. Okay. I want to tell you about <coughs> the Lagrangian points. Lagrangian points. Okay. You have the Earth, and you have the Moon. Earth, and you have the Moon. Okay. Between those 
And now, okay, okay. So I have the L and the, the new. And now we'll switch the reference system we are considering. We are no longer like looking at it from the top, yeah, on the, on the top of the solar system, but we we'll, uh, move <coughs> as the moon moves, okay? And uh, I'll now make a demonstration of what the movement of Earth and Moon looks like if we move along the axis uh, of Australia. It looks like this. Okay? So in reality, Moon is traveling, but we are moving our, our eyes yeah, with the Moon. And then it just, it just looks like this. Okay? I, I'm only changing the reference systems. It makes things easier for, for what I want to do. Okay. Uh, now there's a special point between the Earth and the Moon called the first Lagrange point here. And it has a very special property, namely, if you put something there without velocity, it will just stay there forever. No At this point, all the forces um, cancel each other. At this point, you have a force, gravitational force pulling you to the moon. You have a force pulling you to the earth. And you have a centrifugal force pulling you outwards. The centrifugal force is what you experience if you do with a partner like this thing, yeah? Then uh, both of you are experiencing a force outside of the common center. And at this Lagrange point, L1, all those forces exactly cancel. We have a, a demonstration of this. <coughs> uh, what do you mean by... Um, example, when you said the moon is like that. We are seeing from the point of view of Imagine a line between the moon yeah. and the moon. Yeah, imagine a line between the Earth and the moon. And yeah, then L, moon, and L1 is this green dot here. And so the simulation is already run. <coughs> <laughs> I, have, I have not pressed pause. It's already running. Isn't there a point? There's a fifth point. There. Oh. Right. <laughs> These are the five Lagrangian points. These are the points where all the forces involved exactly cancel. I try, want to explain first for a second point, just to have an idea for this one. This point experiences gravitational pull to the Earth, to the Moon, and outwards of the common point of center where Earth and Moon revolve around, which is like slightly to the top of the Earth, like here. 4,000 kilometers from the center of the Earth. Yeah? So uh, all, people always say that the moon is revolving around the Earth, but that's not quite true. In fact, they're revolving around each other. Yeah? So before I take the question, just let me show this to you. Um, because they don't show you this in school. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just, um, yeah, just have a look. Uh, don't look at the ISS, just look at Earth and moon. Yeah? You see the Earth wobbling. This is because Earth and Moon rotate about the common center of mass. Yes? Are you? <laughs> and you see it's here to our shape. That's why there's twi twice um, a day of love and a uh, tide coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, <laughs> so questions? <coughs> yes? Yeah. Uh, the second thing is actually a question. Yeah. The Lagrange points already sound unstable. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's very good point. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip this question because I want to show you a few things and they're only zero minutes. Give me now. Yeah. So first, I speed up the simulation. Numerical errors, 
those bodies placed at those Lagrangian points slightly moved away from the Lagrangian points. What are the consequences? So if you have this L1 point, yeah, let me start the simulation. Yeah. Here, this point, L1, yeah, assume that it was slightly off, for instance, slightly near to the Earth, then the pull to the Earth will dominate and it will start falling towards the Earth. See it? See it? It scrolls towards the Earth. And it's also deflected because of a centrifugal force and Coriolis force. Yeah? And then it does crazy stuff. The same is true here because of numerical rounding errors. The body slightly leaves the Lagrangian point, but as you were able to observe, Okay. <laughs> I was uh, too impatient. I accelerated too much, and then the numerical errors control everything. And this is a good speed. These two Lagrangian points, F4 and F5, they are called stable. Because if you slightly deviate from those points, you will not go into crazy things, but you will stay around those points forever in a chaotic fashion, but you will stay around those points. I think this is quite cool because normally, <laughs> yeah, so you are accustomed that things rotate around like a central massive body. Yeah? The moon is rotating around the earth. Okay. You are not accustomed for things to travel around some imaginary point in space where nothing is there. Yeah? And the Lagrangian point is just a mathematical thing. There's no no like sun or planet there. And still bodies can orbit that imaginary point. Okay, and now let let me try to explain to you what's the idea of these new kind of circuits are. Okay. So you have seen these Lagrange points. These large Lagrange points are very extremely sensitive to you on the initial conditions. If I'm at one of the Lagrange points and do just a slight touch in some direction, just very much, just, just a little bit, yeah, then you can uh, exert great consequences later on. Okay. And now it turns out, uh, this work by a pioneer in work by Bebouro in the 80s, that there are things called weak stability boundaries. So here you see the moon, and then you see several layers drawn around it, Spe approximately spheres, but like very distorted spheres. Yeah? One for each velocity. If you manage to arrive at such a point with the correct velocity, <coughs> then a very special thing happens, namely you enter a chaotic motion which for some time stays on this weak stability boundary. Yeah? If, you, if you manage to arrive here and have the velocity as indicated by the arrow, you will go like in a crazy fashion, but you will stay on this weak stability surface, weak stability boundary. If you now do a little touch to the inside, you will be captured by the planet. You will enter a stable orbit around the planet. By contrast, if you do a slight nudge away from the <coughs> central body, you will leave the system. You're exploiting the chaotic dependency of the, right, uh, the great sensitivity on the initial conditions. If you just chill and do nothing, yeah, then you will have a chaotic motion for some point, for, for some amount of time, and then you will randomly either get attracted to the central body or you will get <coughs> How much is a slight touch? A uh, slight touch means you can do it uh, with uh, manipulative data, like maneuvering thrusters, like very, very small amounts of data. But not like molecules or something? No, not molecules, but... Uh, it depends on their speed. It depends on their speed. This is one body of the problem. No, this is not the one body problem. So with the one body problem, we assume that there's only one body having gravita gravitational effects on all the others. You do not have any kind of chaoticity. You don't have any kind of chaos. 
you only have these chaotic effects if you consider two or three or even more bodies, um, uh, each having gravitational effects on all on, uh, on themselves and also on your rocket. So how do you use these kind of weak stability boundaries? For instance, you want to reach the moon, yeah? And you want to do it without breaking at the moon. You want to do it ballistically. You want the moon to capture you, yeah? Then you pick some point on this, velocity, on this boundary, yeah? And then you uh, calculate backwards in time where you would have, where, uh, uh, so then, then, then you find a point where you need to start so that in the future you are arrive right there. And when you are right there, then you just have to do a little touch and you will be captured by the moon. By the way, yeah. you said towards or away from the moon. Yeah. Uh, are, are you really talking about... No, no, I'm not talking about radio, but I'm uh, talking right, about right, right, right. asking him and then <laughs> like, finding the reference. Uh, the dot in the middle, is yeah. that uh, indicating the moon? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this before was a graphical sketch. This is an actual plot from a site of the paper. But uh, you see the boundary like here. Yeah? And these are the orbits around the stable Lagrange points. Just want to show you that it's not like an idea of it. Yeah? And in fact, I want to tell you one last story in two minutes. The rescue of the, uh, sorry, no time questions. Uh, the rescue of the Haiti Keaton. So this was the first lunar probe by the Japanese, and they were like very happy. It was a satellite containing a smaller satellite, and the goal was for the smaller satellite to reach moon. The smaller satellite, uh, the, the larger satellite was never meant to go to moon. It didn't have enough fuel. It only was there to keep the smaller satellite into orbit and then give it a push to the right direction. Okay, the, uh, so the problem was after the small satellite separated, contact was lost, and we do not know to this point what's ever happened with the small satellite, which was this tiny growth to the moon. So the Japanese were left with a functioning satellite in orbit of the Earth, but which did not have enough fuel to reach. Remember one billion dollars and then again one billion dollars. Ben Bruno, the mathematician who worked on this paper, uh, um, noticed it and wrote a fax, a fax to the Japanese Space Agency. And by some kind of miracle, it was actually noticed by some nerd <laughs> working there and of course not got into crash. And then Ben Bruno devised this orbit, this trajectory for the heat to reach moon, and the Japanese guys tried it and it worked. It was like this. Here at the end, you see the weak stability thing. You have to reach it. For this, you have to creep on very, very slowly to it. Um, and the way you did this was first go to a point which is far away, point C. There you have chaos. You have very sensitive conditions on the initial uh, things. Yeah? With a slight change there, you can achieve great consequences later on. In this example, the great consequence left on was that it took backwards to reach the weak stability point. <coughs> and there, the, the, uh, the, the heat probe only had to do a little touch to, in order to be captured by the moon and the uh, I want to tell you the problem with this approach. The, pro uh, the good thing is you need vastly less data B, and you do not have to carry like high-powered rockets Till the end of your of your journey, yeah, where all things can go wrong, where you can explode, where you may fail to start it again. The bad thing is, it takes more time. The usual travel time to the moon is like three days. This year took two years. Yeah? Um, it took like one year to go from the orbit it was previously on to this orbit, and then six months from here to here, and then a further six months. Into, to change it to the current orbit they want to have around you. My final picture, and then enjoy the other sessions. This is all, all, all uh, um, two happening in nature. So here you see stars getting sucked away from some galaxy via some kind of this low energy uh, trajectory. Yeah? This is called the intergalactic transport network. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and also there are like comets traveling um, on these kind of trajectories. Comets for like eight years of traveling, and this way it's going to destinations which they couldn't reach otherwise. And I think now we make sense of uh, this picture here at the beginning of part two. This, this is the interpla natural interplanetary transport network. It's the closest approximation we have to true bonds. Thank you very much for your attention.